discuss two apparently contradictory methodological issues. But I will give examples, and after the examples, uh, you can decide for yourself just how contradictory these two approaches really are, or whether they can be complementary, or even whether they actually can interpenetrate, so to speak. That is, there is no Great Wall of China that divides these two methods. You might recall, I described the two methods as the first one being a scientific method. Notice that I do not say the scientific method because I don't think that expression makes any sense. And the other one, we simply call the interpretive method. And I mentioned that the scientific method, uh, uh, again, I don't mean a definitive scientific method, but uh, uh, what we normally call the scientific method usually has a great deal to do with mathematical modeling and statistical testing and so on and so forth. As a paradigmatic example of the interpretive approach, I mentioned literature, but of course, every social science could have an interpretive approach being the most pertinent example, but uh, economics, sociology, anthropology, all these could have interpretive approaches as well. But before I discuss them further, uh, let me just talk a bit about method itself, because uh, uh, if people get too bogged down in method, sometimes substance itself may be lost. Uh, Let's recall uh, what T.S. Eliot actually has to say on this. He says that there is no method but to be very intelligent. Right at the outset, I want us to be reminded of this because truly, uh, if you think that you can solve substantive problems simply by choosing some clever method, you are very wrong. You have to be very intelligent. Also, Franz Fanon, from another point of view, uh, reminds us that there is a point at which methods devour themselves. Fanon, who participated in national liberation struggles, uh, especially the Algerian struggle, actually was talking specifically about methods of political science, politics, psychology, psychoanalysis, etc. And finally, Thomas Henry Huxley, the great biologist, tells us no delusion is greater than the notion that method and industry can make up for a lack of mother wit, either in science or in practical life. So with that kind of cautionary remark, uh, now I have to sally forth and uh, actually look at uh, methods as they're applied in economics and in other areas. First, for uh, illustrating the scientific approach, I have chosen two examples. Uh, both actually are from my own work, uh, but they are based on other people's work, obviously, and therefore uh, I hope this is not just an exercise in self-glorification. Uh, the first uh, approach under the heading scientific approach is what I have called non-parametric tests. The second one, the opposite seemingly of the non-parametric tests is parametric tests. The problem in the first case for non-parametric test is do IMF structural adjustment policies meet IMF targets? Which is an interesting question because normally people are talking about other targets, uh, but IMF itself actually has many targets that it said initially. And for the paper that I did with my former student, Hitoshi Sogabe from Japan, uh, one version of the paper uh, has been published uh, in that volume, Economic Justice for Africa, which is on reserve. In that work with Hitoshi Sogabe, uh, we chose eight variables of interest, interest to IMF, that is. First is current account balance. Second, overall balance. Third, rate of inflation. Fourth, employment rate. Fifth, economic growth rate. Sixth, 
saving rate, seventh, investment rate, and finally, the eighth variable is real consumption growth rate. So given these variables, the question was, did the structural adjustment policies make any difference? Our finding actually is that they did not. But how did we find that out? How did we get to that conclusion? Briefly, we chose a cross-section of countries for our data. And then our strategy was to look at before versus after the policies and compare what happened. There are tests that can do that without assuming any distribution of the variables. Uh, we used two tests. One is Wilcoxon rank sum test. The other one is Mann Whitney test. I don't want to get into the technicalities here, uh, but they are described in various places, uh, quite well-known tests. Uh, intuitively, they actually describe whether things move together or they move in the same direction or move in the opposite direction. And then there is a way to systematize these movements and derive specific conclusions with a certain level of significance attached to them. Uh, the level of significance that we uh, tested at was 95%, uh, or uh, the rejection probability would be 0 0.05 when the hypothesis actually uh, uh, was something that could not be rejected. So uh, like every uh, statistical test, this is also a test uh, that is not foolproof. On the other hand, it is quite precisely indicated uh, uh, at what level you can accept that. That is, at what probability level you can accept the hypothesis. So we, were, we found out that IMF policies actually failed to meet IMF's own targets, uh, which actually was uh, uh, something that uh, uh, was quite unpleasant for the IMF ideologues uh, at the time when, it, when we found this. So this scientific method can actually help us settle some very important policy issues. The second example is about parametric tests. And the problem here is, does foreign aid increase development expenditures significantly? Of course, uh, in most cases, foreign aid does increase development expenditures to some extent. The question is, uh, is that extent significant statistically? How do you know? The finding this time is that it depends. In some cases, yes, it does. In others, no, it doesn't. What kind of data did we need to look at that? In this case, we actually were lucky enough to find time series data for a number of countries. Uh, with my co-authors, uh, I worked on India and uh, uh, also uh, on uh, a number of countries together. Uh, uh, but uh, I decided that we really needed to do a, a number of country studies, uh, taking time series data for each country. And therefore, I went on my own and did time series studies for Bangladesh, for Indonesia, for uh, Malaysia and Thailand. The strategy for this work was to formulate what econometricians call simultaneous equations model. Uh, the idea is that uh, the same variable may occur on the left-hand side as well as on the right-hand side. That is, the same variable determines some others uh, as well as itself is determined by others. Hence the term simultaneous. I came up with a three equation model and used tests uh, uh, that are called t-tests and f-tests to test hypotheses as to whether foreign aid entered in a significant way in increasing development expenditures. And I've already told you what we found. So these are two examples of scientific work that can lead to some insights, it seems, uh, apparently in uh, uh, economics. However, uh, uh, there have been a great deal of criticism of scientific method as well. Uh, but before I go into the criticisms, uh, let me uh, uh, remind ourselves that uh, 
Even writers, uh, a great writer, in fact, uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, uh, an American novelist of great renown, uh, when somebody asked him uh, how he wrote uh, his great Gatsby, he said to write it, it took three months. To conceive it, three minutes. To collect the data for it, all my life. Well, there you go. Looks like in literature, too, you need data but maybe of a different sort, and maybe the processing has to be different. But there is no alternative to hard work, uh, whether it is uh, uh, social science of mathematical statistical variety or social science of interpretive variety, and the same applies, of course, for the interpretive variety called literature. And uh, Robert Frost actually expresses it, as usual, very succinctly and very well when he tells us that the best way out is always the best way out is always true. But people have raised a number of uh, very important objections to science itself. Uh, uh, Gilbert Keith Chesterton, for example, tells us that science in the modern world has many uses. Its chief use, however, is to provide big words to cover the errors of the rich. Churchill himself, who was rich, at least uh, up to a point in his life, uh, and certainly supported the rich, told us the latest refinements of science are linked with the cruelties of the Stone Age. And Barbara Ehrenreich, a feminist uh, writer uh, uh, in our times, tells us, thus will the fondest dream of phallic science be realized a pristine new planet populated entirely by little boy clones of great scientific entrepreneurs, free to smash atoms, accelerate particles, or, if they are so moved, build pyramids without any social relevance or human responsibility at all. Well, I guess after Hiroshima and Auschwitz, uh, one is quite justified in making such critical remarks about science. Uh, but uh, uh, the error probably lies uh, with the users uh, uh, and the crimes that have been committed uh, in the name of science. Uh, although uh, clearly many scientists would be implicated, uh, uh, largely come from a lack of paying attention to ethics. And this indeed is, is very, very important because uh, uh, quite often uh, the destruction of world is justified uh, uh, in the name of saving the world, which would lead some people to observe that what we are really doing is making the world safe for hypocrisy. So uh, we need to take that seriously. And I just want to read you something uh, from Amos Cesaire of whom a great deal more you will learn uh, very soon. But this is his criticism of science and his defense of poetry as another way to know. <clears throat> this is from an essay which actually is called Poetry and Knowledge. Poetic knowledge is born in the great silence of scientific knowledge. Mankind, once bewildered by sheer facts, finally dominated them through reflection, observation, and experiment. Henceforth, mankind knows how to make its way through the forest of phenomena. It knows how to utilize the world. But it is not the lord of the world on that account. A view of the world, yes, science affords a view of the world, but a summary and superficial view. Physics classifies and explains, but the essence of things eludes it. The natural sciences classify, but the quid proprium of things eludes them. As for mathematics, what eludes its abstract and logical activity is reality itself. In short, scientific knowledge enumerates, measures, classifies, and kills. But it is not sufficient to state that scientific knowledge is summary. It is necessary to add that it is poor and half-starved. 
To acquire it, mankind has sacrificed everything, desires, fears, feelings, psychological complexes. To acquire the impersonality of scientific knowledge, mankind depersonalized itself, de-individualized itself. An impoverished knowledge, I submit, for at its inception, whatever other wealth it may have, there stands an impoverished humanity. In Aldous Huxley's Do What You Will, there is a very amusing page. We all think we know what a lion is. A lion is a desert-colored animal with a mane and claws and an expression like Garibaldi's. But it is also in Africa, all the neighboring antelopes and zebras, and therefore, indirectly, all the neighboring grass. If there were no antelopes and zebras, there would be no lion. When the supply of game runs low, the king of beasts grows thin and mangy. It seizes all together, and he dies. It is just the same with knowledge. Scientific knowledge is a lion without antelopes and without zebras. It is gnawed from within, gnawed by hunger, the hunger of feeling, the hunger of life. Then dissatisfied mankind sought salvation elsewhere, in the fullness of here and now. And mankind has gradually become aware that side by side with this half-starved scientific knowledge, there is another kind of knowledge, a fulfilling knowledge. The Ariadne's thread of this discovery, some very simple observations, on the faculty that permitted the human, whom one must call the primitive scientist, to discover the most solid truths without benefit of induction or deduction, as if by flair. And here, we are taken back to the first days of humanity. It is an error to believe that knowledge, to be born, had to await the methodical exercise of thought or the scruples of experimentation. I even believe that mankind has never been closer to certain truths than in the first days of the species. At the time when mankind discovered with emotion the first sun, the first rain, the first breath, the first moon. At the time when mankind discovered in fear and rapture the throbbing newness of the world. Attraction and terror, trembling and wonderment strangeness and intimacy. Only the sacred phenomenon of love can still give us an idea of what that solemn encounter can have been. It is in this state of fear and love, in this climate of emotion and imagination, that mankind made its first, most fundamental, and most decisive discoveries. It was both desirable and inevitable that humanity should accede to greater precision. It was both desirable and inevitable that humanity should experience nostalgia for greater feeling. It is that mild autumnal nostalgia that threw mankind back from the clear light of scientific day to the nocturnal forces of poetry. So this is the defense of poetry in contrast with science. And Cesar, who is a poet who does and not just talks about doing, uh, will talk more about his poetry uh, in the third part of today's uh, presentation. But let me just leave you with a fragment of one of his poems that I think uh, really captures the spirit of everything he tells us about the significance of poetry and of the significance of knowledge that we can gain through poetry. Ma parole capturement de colère, soleils a calculé mon être, natif, natal, cyclo violet de cyclone. My words, arresting angers, suns by which to count my native, natal being, violet cyclops of cycle. I hope you will enjoy the presentations today. Uh, after this, uh, you will actually 
uh, be transported to a day not so long ago, uh, just when this country was talking about invading Iraq on 5th of March 2003, a number of us uh, decided to actually use poetry to gain knowledge about war, about preparations for war. And here in GSIS, we held an event which was videotaped, and you will be able to see and judge for yourself. And the next part will be actually the third part of a series about a Mrs. Air that is not just about his poetry, but also about the problems of development, uh, in particular problems of development in Africa, the political economy of development, the psychology of development, the ecology of development, and the future of development and the future of humankind. So I hope you will enjoy them, you will reflect on them, and you will be able to write something on them in the future. Thank you. Good afternoon. This is the first of the two lectures that uh, I would have videotaped for you, which you are now viewing in my absence. I must uh, begin by telling you that I haven't felt this way since uh, I stopped being an actor in then Pakistan television. <laughs> and that was many, many years ago. The last time I was videotaped was actually during the performance of uh, North Indian classical music, which was about rain. And in this context, uh, probably snow is the more appropriate word. I certainly wouldn't want that to happen in my absence. <clears throat> I'd like to begin by thanking those who are here during the actual taping session. Uh, you all have been very kind to come at a very short notice and be here so that uh, it could be a little more like the classroom that I very much want to be in, but unfortunate, unfortunately, I'm not able to under the circumstances. I hope that uh, remembering uh, the special circumstances which compel me to do this, uh, you will be patient and I hope that uh, there is something that can be learned, even if I'm with you, not in flesh, but only as a disembodied spirit <laughs> with a shadow. So even if it is ghostly, I hope it will not be ghastly. I also am about to talk to you a subject that has genuine aspects of being baffling, even to people who have been studying this subject for some time. So there may be many points, including technical points, that will need further elaboration and clarification. For your convenience, Professor Naufal Umari is at hand, and he will be able to answer any of the technical questions that you might have. For questions pertaining to Japanese economy, there are also a number of advanced graduate students in the room who will be of some help. If you still have further questions, I will request you to write them down. And when I come, as I have said, I will meet with each and every one of you individually. And at that time, we can go over the remaining questions that you might have. My format during these lectures will be to introduce some basic issues and facts and analysis with clarifying questions from the audience, I hope. And at the end of each lecture, I will leave you with a few pregnant questions, I hope, which will generate discussion in my absence. I very much like to be a part of this, I repeat, teaching is truly a vocation for me. And there are very few things in my life I enjoy more than being in a vigorous intellectual discussion 
with students who I know soon will be my peers. Let's start today <coughs> with Japan, the macroeconomic aspects. We can begin by what I have written down as the basic income expenditure equation. Before I explain this, which some of you I'm sure will be familiar with from your introductory macroeconomics courses, let me point out that in macroeconomics, as well as in other branches of economics, we quite often make the distinction between real and financial or sometimes monetary variables or aspects of the economy. Uh, there is a school of thought in economics which actually sees the monetary sector as simply being uh, a translation in monetary terms of whatever goes on in the real sector. However, uh, there are other economists who see the financial and monetary sectors as having a life of their own and the interaction between the real and the financial sectors as being of prime importance. One of the major messages of the Keynesian revolution in the late 30s was precisely this, in my view. But today, instead of getting involved in these arcane controversies about the relationships between these various sectors, what I will do is, first of all, simply present to you a picture of the real sector. Then I will discuss some aspects of the financial sectors. And then, hopefully, you will be able to put two and two together and end up with four. First of all, let me explain what the terms of this equation mean, and then we will go through them, or at least the ones among them that are relevant in the Japanese case during the course of this lecture. The Y on the left-hand side is national income. It could be either gross or net. Net national income is gross national income minus depreciation, as all of you know. On the right-hand side, we have consumption expenditure, which is denoted by C, investment expenditure, which is denoted by I. If it is gross investment, then it includes depreciation, and that corresponds to the gross national income or gross national product on the left-hand side. If the investment is net, that is to say if it is gross investment minus depreciation, then the left-hand side would correspond to the net national product or net national income. Moving farther along on the right-hand side, we have G, which is very important, especially in Japanese case, but in all other cases as well, government expenditure. And finally, the part that everybody seems to focus on and talk about which we will not talk about very much in this lecture, is X minus M. X denotes exports, M imports. So X minus M is net exports. Now this can be either an equation or an identity. If it is an identity, then it is always true that the right-hand side will be equal to the left-hand side. And that happens when all these are measured ex post. So ex post, this is always true. But if these are planned expenditures, etc., then we do not know if the aggregate demand would always be equal to aggregate supply in the economy. They will be so in what economists call equilibrium of the economy. So if the economy is in equilibrium, again, this equation will be satisfied. First, we want to look at some figures for Japan uh, in connection with the growth rate of uh, various items of interest in this economy. And all these, of course, are exposed figures. These are figures that have been collected 
and manipulated, we hope not too unfairly, and then published by reliable sources in Japan. I begin with the figures for 1987, the most recent year for which I have this available. In 1987, the Japanese GNP, this is the gross national product, grew by 4.2 percentage points. This is lower than the historic growth rate in the post-war period, but higher than growth rate in the previous few years since the appreciation of yen. It's also higher by a considerable margin than growth rates in other corresponding industrial countries of the world. Japanese employment grew by less than 1%. It grew by only 0.8%. That should indicate to us that even though there may not be a growth problem facing the Japanese economy, especially if one compares the Japanese economy with the other economies of the world today. There may indeed be a growing employment or unemployment problem in Japan. Indeed, this is the prospect that has begun to worry many Japanese policymakers, and certainly Japanese workers and potential workers uh, who are sitting in the college classrooms like you are today. <coughs> Japanese output per man hour also is higher now, even with appreciation of the yen and higher wages. It is close to 3.5% in terms of the growth rate, which is modest compared to what happened in the past, but is by no means unfavorable given the much more sluggish productivity growths in the other industrialized countries of the world. Let us turn now to saving investment situation in Japan, which is a rather big piece of the puzzle of the so-called Japanese miracle, the tremendous growth that Japan was able to achieve at the end of the Second World War, something that continues up till today. If we compare Japan, Japanese uh, saving with the US saving as the percentage of their gross domestic product. Now, gross domestic product technically is different from gross national product, and Professor Umari can explain to you how it is different. Uh, roughly, there is something called net factor payments abroad that will be excluded from gross domestic product. But still, it's a very good indicator as a base and a good basis for comparison of other factors like saving and investment across nations in the world. In case of Japan, in 1973, the percentage of saving as gross domestic product was 38.1%, which is considerable. In case of the US, the corresponding figure was 20.4%. So it is probably going to give you the idea that it's not just because Japanese are hardworking or so-called economic animals, uh, which they may or may not be, there are some differences in the macroeconomic aggregates, like saving between the two countries. In fact, the difference is considerable. The flip side of this, of course, is that the Japanese consumed a lot less than the US. If you add to the saving picture also the US balance of trade deficit, or certainly the large import that the US have historically engaged in uh, from Japan as well as other countries, then you might also conclude that the US per capita consumption was a lot more than the Japanese per capita consumption. So the Japanese didn't leave as well as the Americans did. They still don't. They saved a lot more. And they invested a great deal more too. <clears throat> 
The investment figures for that year are also very interesting. Japan invested 38.1%, so all the investment could be actually financed by the saving that was generated. And this is exposed, so it shouldn't surprise anybody. US also correspondingly invested 20.4, so either somebody played statistical tricks or things actually turned out the way they were. Japanese saving figures continue to decline as a percentage of their GDP. In 1978, saving as a percentage of GDP was 30.9%. For the US, it increased slightly to 21.3%, but there still remained a gap. Japan actually ended up investing uh, a corresponding amount as well. And then in 1986, Japanese saving and investment figures started dropping a little more, 28.1%, but US figures also dropped to 18.8%. So we have to conclude that there is a narrowing but persistent gap between the saving investment situation between Japan and the United States. Japan actually has always had a higher percentage of its GDP saved and invested. All other things being equal, this should be considered a major factor in explaining the differential growth rates of GDP between Japan and the United States. And the rapid catching up that Japan actually was so successful in doing during the most of its post-war period history, but most surprisingly after the 1973 oil crisis. In 1973, with that oil crisis, many people had thought that Japanese economy would be one of the hardest hit, and for a while it was, but Japan did recover from it and did rather well. Though this should be the subject of a future discussion, uh, we will be talking about the government and the industrial policy, hopefully after I return. There are figures regarding the contribution to changes in real GDP. Uh, I will refer you to an excellent book that has just been published recently from Institute of International Economics in Washington, DC by Professor Bela Balasa at Johns Hopkins and Marcus Noland. The title is Japan in the World Economy. And on page 10 of that book, there are figures which show which part on the right-hand side contributes the most to the growth in GNP or GDP of Japan. And they conclude, and this seems to me to be quite reasonable given the facts, that domestic expenditures are really the key to the explanation of Japanese growth from the expenditure side. So there are two sides. On the one hand, Japan saves more and invests more. So investment certainly is, is, is uh, very, very important. And that's one component of domestic expenditures. But there is also the other component, the government expenditure. That also goes a long way. But quite interestingly, the Japanese government expenditure has always been less historically, both in terms of aggregate figures as well as percentage of GNP than the major industrialized Western countries, especially the United States. So let's remember this as a puzzle about government expenditure, which I will cover in the second lecture. Uh, what does the government do in Japan that makes it so much more productive, quote unquote, in a sense, uh, with respect to making the economy grow? Something that apparently hasn't happened with as much gusto, at least in the West. I want to turn now to a closer analysis of Japanese saving, a topic that many people have written about. And one might say that uh, this is one of the areas in which there really has been more heat than light, especially in discussions in this country. 
any reasonable kind of discussion on saving really should start with the basics and then move on. The fundamental basic issue in saving is one of definition. We must start with the definition of saving that is reasonable, and people don't always start here. It might seem elementary, but it has a great deal to do with much of the controversy which uh, people have gotten involved in uh, when people have been meaning very different things by saving here and saving in Japan. So in order to avoid all those controversies, which in my view are quite useless, we will start with a fairly simple definition of saving, which I think is reasonable. This simple definition of saving is the one that defines saving as deferred consumption. You don't consume now so that you might be able to consume later. As a nation, this means that you forego present consumption and hopefully in the future you might be able to consume more. Uh, whether you do that or not, the definition of saving simply is deferred consumption. It encompasses purchases of real and financial assets. And when you do that, then you get the flip side of saving, which is investment. One of the greatest contribution of Keynes was actually to convince the economists at one point anyway, that planned saving may not necessarily equal planned investment in an economy. Now, how do we calculate the value of current saving in an economy? The economist's definition of the value of current saving is really equal to pres the present discounted value of future consumption. Having defined saving as future consumption, if you were to look at a time during which you're going to compute the saving, uh, a dollar saved today is not the same as a dollar saved tomorrow. So given your accounting period, you actually have to discount the value back. The farther into the future the amount is, the less valuable it is at present, unless you are completely indifferent to whether you consume now or you consume later. But most of, our, most of us are probably uh, a little impatient uh, at various times, and so future isn't quite the same to us as the present. We'd much rather have probably uh, something now than to have a lot more of the same thing in the future. <clears throat> now with some qualifications which uh, might be elaborated during discussion, uh, this is the uh, idea of saving that I'm going to be using during this lecture. A second issue having defined saving is the issue of at what level one is carrying on the discussion. The economists call this the aggregation issue. So the first issue